It's March 21st, 1152, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. British history buff, Eleanor of Aquitaine may be familiar to you as the wife of Henry II, but you may not know that she had actually been married before, in fact just a few weeks before, because it was today in history in 1152 that she officially parted ways with her first husband, King Louis VII of France, in what has been called the most expensive divorce ever. Except this wasn't a divorce, technically, because divorce didn't exist in the Middle Ages. You could only get an annulment and the Pope had to give it to you. And that essentially said that the marriage had never existed in the first place or was a concession which said, OK, go and be single forever, but you can definitely never remarry. What's unusual about this one is that she'd been Queen of France and then she got to be Queen of England very quickly afterwards. <laughs> What's even stranger is that she got to take her fortune with her in the first place because you'd expect that when you marry and then divorce the King of France you'd expect that you don't get a cent, <laughs> you know, not one single cent when you guys split up. But actually, according to the feudal rules at the time, whatever the woman had brought into the marriage went with her at the end, and she actually had an awful lot. Because Eleanor was the only heiress of uh, William X, who was Duke of Aquitaine, and he possessed one of the largest domains in all of France, which actually put the possessions of even the French kings in the shade. And it's impossible to underestimate just how powerful and wealthy Aquitaine was. It included the major European trading cities of Bordeaux, Toulouse and Poitiers and it also wielded huge cultural influence across Europe. It was the centre of the romantic chivalric ballads that were the, you know, the courtly form of entertainment at the time and Eleanor had received a top-notch education, both academic you know, she had learned Latin, she did maths, she did everything that, you know, most women wouldn't have been able to do at the time and also... Yeah, but she came with a large region of southwest France I'm not talking about this as anything to do with her personal qualities. She could have been I an mean, absolute dunce and stunk and she still would have been married <laughs> she off was, well she guess was what impressive. she wasn't a dunce she didn't no. stink she had courtly <laughs> talents as well she could do music she could do languages she could do horseback riding she was pretty she wore really expensive dresses and she made quite a stir when she turned up in the French court in Paris the court in Paris was actually quite austere the northern region of France which was the heart of the kingdom was actually relatively underdeveloped at this point so it was something really different to what she was used to she'd grown up in the splendour of her father's court and so she arrived in Paris in all her, she had lavish jewellery, she had dresses that were considered immodest by the kind of, are they sound, the courtiers in Paris, they sound uptight. Mm, mm. You know, she had a... Not French re- like you're thinking now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. She had what we would probably recognise as a Mediterranean zest yeah. for life, which apparently Louis was besotted with at first, but later on it just, they had very different personalities. You know, he had grown up in these rather austere surroundings and he had been destined for the monastery until his older brother died, making him the heir. So they were just extremely different people. Mm. And she liked to dig at him for that. Uh, She went around telling her friends that she married a monk, not a king. Mm. (laughs) And what that was getting at was that their sex life, frankly, wasn't great. She found him boring and pious and boyish, and he didn't really want to sleep with her for pleasure. He believed very devoutly that marriage was necessary for procreation, but not for pleasure, in accordance with the teachings of the Catholic Church. And therefore, it took quite a long time for them to get pregnant. Uh, Their first child was a daughter, Marie, born in 1145, eight years after their wedding. Mm. And then came two more daughters. This was bad news for him because he wanted a male heir. Yeah, and it came to be the reason that was given for his desire to uh, separate from her. Actually, they'd become estranged in any case during the Second Crusade, which was fought from 1147 to 1149, when Eleanor... It does, it's a bit Like a lot of couples, they fought on holiday. (laughs) (laughs) So exactly, so they'd gone away together. I mean, it was quite unusual and probably speaks to her character character that she'd gone with Louis in in any case on this crusade. But it really hadn't worked out for their relationship because A, uh, Louis had proved to be a terrible military leader. Plus she had won plaudits for her role in the thing in the first place. You know, she was, she was seen as this brave woman who was riding alongside her husband. And also there were some uh, intimations that there was some sort of unusual uh, and very close relationship going on between Eleanor and her uncle Raymond of Poitiers uh, and that may 
made uh, Louis even more jealous than he probably was in any case. Yeah, I mean, Raymond wasn't just her uncle. He was also the Prince of Antioch. So he was stationed at a very important part of the crusade, the city of Antioch. And it was at this point that he fell out with Louis over the direction that the crusade should take. She sided with her uncle. And actually, he was probably right, because the French forces really underperformed on this crusade. They didn't really achieve anything that they set out to do. And Eleanor became a bit of a scapegoat for this, mm. not only because of these rumours that she was having an affair with her uncle, but also there was this incident where the French forces were massacred during the retreat. And there was a rumour spread that it was due to the size of her baggage train, that, you know, that she'd bought too many suitcases and it had slowed them down. WTF. The, I mean, it's just, it's such obvious misogyny you see now, isn't it? Like all the stuff about her being kind of flighty and flirtatious. It was there to besmirch her reputation, clearly. Yeah, and by the end of the crusade, by the time they went to return from Jerusalem to France, so serious was the rift between Louis and Eleanor that they took separate ships. You've heard of couples <laughs> taking separate taxis home after a fight. They took separate ships. <laughs> And they had in 1149 previously been to see the Pope and asked for an annulment. And on that occasion, he was like, uh, no, but how about having sex? Have you thought about having sex again? And he <laughs> actually showed them into bed, basically. Wow. Um, and that brought about the third daughter, which didn't make things any better. <laughs> so this second time that they went to the Pope, he agreed indeed that they could have an annulment on the basis of consanguinity. Um, in other words, apparently, suddenly, the church realised they were too closely related to be married. Which um, the, the the canon law said you can't have a common ancestor within seven generations. But obviously, if you look too hard at it, that therefore makes all royal marriages invalid. You would imagine. <laughs> and it's particularly hilarious because she was actually fourth cousins with Louis, but with her next marriage with Henry, who uh, we'll go into shortly, she was third cousin. So she was actually closer to the person who she <laughs> married next than the one that she just had to get a divorce because she was too closely related to. Marriages like theirs were in kind of a grey area because among the aristocracy, if they had held firm to this idea that you couldn't have a common ancestor within seven generations, pretty much no aristocrats would have been able to get married. So, you know, they did tend to turn a blind eye. And so then it was convenient that Eleanor just happened to remember that actually they were too closely related technically. So maybe let's just undo <laughs> everything. And also happened to remember that she was, in her own right, the richest woman in Europe controlling about a quarter of all <laughs> yeah. France. So this is why this then ended up being called the most costly divorce in history is because she left the relationship with all of that. And then what she went on to do is within two months, marry once more. Uh, this time to Henry of Anjou, who would shortly become Henry II of England. And in doing that, she brought all of her estate and power to England and vastly lessened the power of France and then became the only woman to have been queen of both France and England. There's some contemporary sense that she might have wanted to stay unmarried, but it was really impossible because of her wealth and power that made her a target for kidnapping. And in fact, there was a kidnapping attempt pretty much immediately in the wake of her divorce by Geoffrey of Anjou, uh, which is amusing because the next thing that she does after she was um, almost kidnapped by this guy and she escaped is that she marries Geoffrey's brother. <laughs> so the Henry that we're talking <laughs> about is the brother of this chap who tried to kidnap her and, his, and she was like, well, I guess to get a little bit of safety, I'm going to settle down with this chap instead. <laughs> going to be awkward at the reception. Yeah, sure is. But the way this is written up now is kind of like, well done her, you know, because it's often like, oh, here's my feminist icon from history. Uh, but actually, this wouldn't have been a jolly for her. Mm. Like, she had to leave behind all of the life that she had in France and, crucially, her two daughters, who she probably never saw again, and then come and live in England with this new husband, who it's clear that she had the hots for. I mean, they met each other, ironically, when Henry popped over to pay homage to Louis, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so she'd obviously been kind of planning to, to decamp for, for Henry for a while. But it must have been a big old pivot for her. Mm. Yeah, and she did very quickly get one over on the ex as well because the, the thing that had finally pushed the French court to support their annulment was the fact that they had not produced a male heir. Well, the very next year <laughs> after her marriage to Henry II, she gave birth to William, the first of five sons they would have <laughs> together, while Louis would have to wait until 1165 and his third marriage before he finally sired a male heir. Philip. Also with a woman who was more closely related to him than Eleanor, go figure. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you've got to get closer to get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> 
tomorrow. Queen Victoria's children are feeding him sticky buns. You really don't want a gruesome trampling incident. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.